Me by Jennifer Cruzy is a hilarious and touching rom-com about statistical expert Minerva Dobbs and the gorgeous and successful gambler Calvin Morrissey. They go out to dinner because of a bet and a misunderstanding, and they can't stand each other, and when they say goodbye at the end of their evening, they decide to cut their losses and never see each other again. But fate and the laws of the romance novels have other ideas. Hello and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and my friends, this is such a special episode. Becca Syme is a Gallup-certified strengths coach who has had a tremendous impact on my life, both professionally and personally. This book she chose seems fizzy and fun on the outside, but it's one that really struck with me after I closed the last page. And then I got a chance to sit down and talk to someone about why this book matters so much. And holy moly, was this conversation ever a good one. Today's episode with Becca is all about our perceptions of ourselves and chicken marsala, and I cannot wait for you to hear why Becca thinks Bet Me is the best book ever. Hi, Becca. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited, too. I always get so excited when I get to talk to you. Let's start with you are not only an acclaimed author of many brilliant nonfiction books for writers, which are hugely influential in my life. You are also a USA Today bestselling author of Cozy Mysteries and Romances. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this first off. What is fun about genre hopping? I mean, I... Because I am, I like challenges, right? So I like to learn new things and I'm always looking for like, let's, let's just learn this new thing. I want to watch YouTube videos and learn a new skill. I kind of feel like that as a writer where like I wrote romance for quite a while and I kind of got to the place where I'm like, oh, I feel like really comfortable here. And so I was looking for a new challenge and I had grown up reading and watching a lot of mystery, thriller, suspense. And I was like, I think I want to try that because I think it would be a new challenge. So I really enjoy the learning part, I think, of writing in a new genre. How far will you take that? Like, will your next thing be, I've never written a serial killer. Let's see if I can do it. I've never written, (laughs) I don't know, dinosaur erotica. Let's see if I can do that. Like, will you just go anywhere or does it have to be something that you're already sort of embedded in? So with the mystery in particular, it was something that I had liked a lot, but I have thought about jumping to like urban fantasy, for instance, because Mm. I also read a lot of urban fantasy. Like I kind of went in phases. Like I think a lot of people who are omnivore readers where we read everything, like I went in phases where like for two or three years, all I read was urban fantasy. And then for two or three years, all I read was mystery So I will likely make it through all of my omnivore phases for (laughs) like the rest of my writing career and probably be what I do. (laughs) So you're an omnivore reader, but you really focus, you you get stuck in a genre until you sort of complete, you're a completist Mm -hmm. for that genre. (gasps) Yeah. Like I want to know everything about it. Yeah. How does Mm -hmm. it start? So sometimes I get bored. So like, I'll give an example. I think when I start Like when I hit my phase with romance, I started feeling myself just wanting to read something that was not the same thing that I had been reading. And I kind of felt that like itchy boredom feeling. (laughs) And so I went looking for something and then I would like just pick things up and pick things up and pick things up. Um, And so right now I'm actually reading what I'm not sure how to term this exactly, but I will call it domestic suspense. And I have been hoovering every book of Leon Moriarty that I could possibly hoover and like everything that is related to that particular style of book and um, uh, Lucy Foley, like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, And so I kind of feel like at some point I will reach the end of my interest where I'll start to see it get repeated. And then I'll be like, well, maybe, you know, let's jump into something new. So I do look for that boredom, I guess, maybe. 
Now, the other thing that you do that I and most of my friends know you for is you run the Better Faster Academy. Um, will you tell my listeners what that's about? Yeah, we are an author success alignment company. And the goal is to help authors get what they want. Like that's essentially the long-term goal. We try to figure out using a combination of like environmental, um, uh, there's like six factors that we evaluate on. We're basically evaluating people and having them self-evaluate on six different factors of life and where I fall in different areas and how the, where I fall makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So the sort of tagline is differences matter. Like we're all different and those differences matter in every decision we make. So if I'm a particularly wired type of person with a particular type of environment, with a particular style of writing, right. It's like all of those differences matter in what I expect of myself And so we're trying to help writers figure out how to use the tools in their toolbox that they already have that they don't usually don't know that they have. So it's very hard to describe, but it is ultimately to make me better at faster. (laughs) What I tell people when, because I always encourage everyone to take classes from you. And what I always say is she will teach you to figure out what your strengths are and then teach you how to work on your strengths instead of spending all of your time working Mm -hmm. on your weaknesses, which for those outside of the writing community, I think this is probably true in all careers, Mm -hmm. but in the writing world, we get a lot of advice like Stephen King writes a thousand words a day. And for those of us who don't have that particular discipline or that particular need for discipline, it feels very like, oh my God, I got to write a thousand words a day. Mm -hmm. Or I'm never going to be successful. Or I will never be successful or happy or rich or get married or any of those things that I'm supposed to get. (laughs) And you're the one who says, that's absolutely not your thing. Why don't you do it your way? And it is bizarre when someone tells you that advice and go, guess what? You're not Stephen King. And we all sit there like, wait, what? (laughs) (laughs) The catchphrase that we have around the BFA is question the premise, right? And so it's always like, and it's, it's so funny because- question the premise in theory sounds so like this is not rocket science, but at the (laughs) same time, it's like, okay, here's an example. Imposters don't get imposter syndrome. Like it's not possible for imposters to have imposter syndrome. Okay. But if you don't ever question the premise of what imposter syndrome is and why it exists, then if you feel like you have imposter, you are an imposter and you're worried about it, but the evidence outside would not agree with it, but you still feel like an imposter, then by nature, you are not an imposter because imposters are oblivious. That's the nature (laughs) of an imposter. They don't care if they're imposters or not. They're just walking around being like, I'm the best. I rock. No one can talk to me, but people who actually care if they are an imposter or not, it's like the old adage about like, if you are worried, you're a psychopath, you're not a psychopath imposters don't get imposter syndrome. But if you never question the premise of why am I feeling like an imposter and you just believe your brain, then you never have that moment of perspective. That's like, wait a minute, maybe my brain is not being accurate with its information because of some reason. And then we try to question the premise of like, well, what might that reason be? And then help you get in control of it. So it's, um, it's pretty, fun and intense and complicated. And we joke that like the catchphrase is damn it, Becca. Damn it, it's like, Becca. I'll say, I know I'll be like, imposters don't get imposters. And everybody's like, damn it, Becca. It's a trait of my personality also that because I really like to think deeply about everything. So every time I make a decision about something, I am considering it from a lot of angles and I want to make sure to make the right choice. And so I naturally question the premise just without, you know, Um, And I didn't realize it was something that everybody wasn't doing. So tell me, how did you find this book, Bet Me by Jennifer Cruzy? Oh, man. How did I find this book? I can't even remember. I'm almost 100% sure that it was like a Goodreads thing that somebody Mm -hmm. had suggested. So I read it, it must have been 2008, 2007, somewhere around there. Um, because I keep these little book logs of like all the books that I read and I write a little thing about it. And I noticed 
I, yeah, I went back and was looking at my old logs, looking for when I first read this book. And I'm pretty sure that it was the 2007, 2008 version. And, um, and I, and it was in the middle of all these other Goodreads recommendations. So I'm pretty sure I came across a list somewhere. Okay. And it was, spe- I was specifically looking at that point for foodie romance. And okay. so that was the, the thing that I think drew me to this was the review that someone had posted about how much cooking there was in this book. And that's what I was <laughs> writing at the time. So I was like, let me just deep dive into all this. And oh my gosh, I mean, I just, I lost my mind how much I love this book. Just, <laughs> this is my favorite. It's hard for me to pick a favorite. But if I was like on a desert island and could only take one book with me for the rest of my life, it would be this one. Holy moly. Okay. That's big. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's tell our listeners what it's about. So bet me, which if you're into tropes, right, it is not a bet trope, which is my favorite part about this book is that the whole idea of like the bet itself just launches us into the story, but actually the story is really about enemies to lovers, Mm -hmm. almost like they really, she doesn't like him. He doesn't know how he feels about her, but the, the core of this, um, their conflict is that they're so attracted to each other that they can't not be around each other. And it kind of baffles them a little bit sometimes. It's like, (laughs) why am I even still talking to you? Like what's going on here? And I felt that before that feeling. So I love when books do a really, really good job of that. And I just think she does a superb job of that. Um, But I mean, the core story is sort of like Min is uh, overweight, And has been very beaten down by her family. I think about that. And so there's a trigger warning, of course, like there's um, uh, not necessarily eating disorder trigger, but definitely like food issues, content warning. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's this super hot, I mean, super hot guy. And she does not trust him. She does not believe him. And she knows that he's also made a bet, even though he didn't. Um, spoiler alert, but uh, are we okay giving spoilers? The spoiler yeah. Alert? And you know what? That's not even a spoiler though, because we know his side of it right off. We the know bat. his side right yeah. away. Yeah. She doesn't. She thinks she, she heard him make a bet Yeah. when someone says you couldn't get her in bed in a month and yeah. he doesn't take the bet, but she thinks he took it. She thinks he did. Yeah. Which I love those misunderstandings that are legit misunderstanding it's not like oh you could have had a conversation but like no the stakes are too high yes. to have that conversation oh it's it's just so good and then there's lots of cooking <laughs> there's lots of cooking it, oh my God. i'll tell you what i'm going to learn how to make chicken marsala after reading this yep. i'll tell you that's that that's what i did it's amazing and actually the um my favorite thing to do now i realized more about why i like certain foods because i went crazy trying chicken marsala everywhere. Like every time I would go to an Italian restaurant, I'm like, I got to try this. And I was trying to figure out how to make the thing that they talk about. So I went and like, what are the particular flavors that she talks about and that she really likes? Because of course, everybody's chicken marsala is different. So what did you discover when you figured out what it is that you like about food? What did you learn? Or was it specifically what you like about chicken marsala? Well, or food in general. Okay. And it's it's so funny that you asked that question because I would say what I learned about myself as a foodie is the same thing I learned about myself as a human over time, which is that I prefer things that hit every single note that there is to hit on the flavor scale. So like one of the best parts about chicken marsala is that it has all the textures, right? Like it's crunchy, it's soft, it has... um there's a malleable almost with the chicken, but it's also hard. And then you serve it with something that is um, like sort of wet a little bit, like noodles usually or pasta or something, okay. you know, something like that. So it's like slippery uh, also texture. So it has all of the textures because the chicken is, um, is uh, fr- coated, right? So it's like hard crisp on the outside. Um, and then it has all of the flavor notes. So it's a little bit sweet, a little bit, umami, a little bit salty, a little bit, uh, a little bit savory, a little bit, uh, smoky, 
and there's so there's unctuous butter and it has gravy and mushrooms and stuff like that, but it really hits every single flavor note and every single texture note. If you do it right, it's the same reason I like BLTs, right? BLTs are exactly the same. They hit every flavor note and every texture note. If you do them right. And I have opinions about how to make BLTs, by the way, (laughs) to make sure that happens. Um, But I also like that about human beings. Like I prefer really complex, interesting things. I don't want one note, anything like for anything, thinking, feeling, eating, writing, it has to be complex or it's nothing. Now, would you argue that that is the magic of this particular book, Bet Me, is that it hits oh, gosh, yes. so many things so yes. well? Yes. Can you tell us how? Because I've read others of her books since then, I do think some of it is her writing. Like she is a phenomenal writer. Um, And some of the most memorable characters that I've read, just in terms of how complex, how how complex they are, the characters themselves are in Jenny Cruzy books, because the way she can write people who feel so multifaceted and not just multifaceted, but multi-motivated, like I never feel like they're linear or distillable almost down to like the minor characters. Sometimes I feel like they're super complicated and I know so much about them. Um, Everybody has vulnerability, but also strength, which I really like. Like every character has that. Even when you think you're like, "Uh Oh, this one villainous, right. Or villain, both of them. You're like, Oh, they have this very linear thing. And then at the end, she's like, Oh my gosh, they have this vulnerability that you didn't know about. That was one of my favorite parts when she kept pivoting into the villain couple Ooh, who's yeah. trying to break up our main couple. And I kept thinking like antagonists in romances very often sort of exist on this just sort of villain plane. And that's all we know is, well, they're just, they yeah. were just born evil, I guess. That's all they have. And yes. in this one, <laughs> we keep going back to them. And they keep saying, like, I have got to get this to happen because of this. And you think every time you're like, you are absolutely doing the wrong thing. But also, I get why you're doing that. It's it's right. Not nice, but you're still it makes sense. Right. It's definitely not nice, but it's almost like I mean, I you don't excuse especially Cynthia, because like, you know, more about her motivation than probably you do with David. Uh, with with David's character, David, I'm just kind of like, yeah, you are just a douche. Like you're yeah. just a dude who's a douche. Um, but Cynthia actually felt like she's not doing it for mean reasons. She legitimately thinks that they don't like each other because for all external purposes, if you're not inside their heads, they look like they don't like each other. So what she's doing actually also kind of makes sense in a weird way rationalization is a huge component of all of our villainous acts, by the way. Every time I do something wrong, I have a really good reason. Yep. It is never, it's that whole, like every villain is a hero in their own mind kind of thing. Like she really is. She thinks that she has come across the next greatest thing in pop psychology and and she wants to help couples be, have better relationships and release this book. And I'm like, go, go Mm -hmm. do it, like Mm -hmm. hit it. And then it's like, wait, but don't do that. Like, well, that's a bridge too far. Um, But it's, but you see how she got there and you have so much compassion for her. And actually at the end of the book, I'm always, every time I read it, I'm still like, I just want there to be a good way to resolve this for her in terms of like, cause I actually feel a lot of compassion for her. The very end, which this is no surprise. All romances have a happily ever after. So I'm not, I'm not spoiling anything, but I did kind of think it was, yeah, my mom still fat shames me and his mom is still sort of stuck up about me. And I wanted to pull her aside and go, I'm 52 years old. Please trust me. Those women are never going to change ever. And love does not conquer either of those things. But I also had to say to myself, it's a romance. We have to wrap it up nicely. Sometimes age is not good for romance reading because you do get to the end and you go, 
that's not going to work out like that. <laughs> right. Right. Like, <laughs> oh, look at those idealistic 20 year olds thinking that this will be fine. It's, it's so cute. Right. And I did, I, I, I agree in terms of like, it didn't feel, um, it didn't feel as realistic. I guess maybe that's the thing. Um, in that moment. But I also, I was like, I get that desire, that fantasy, right? Of like, oh, never mind. Everyone now thinks that it's okay to be plus size or curvy or whatever word you're going to use. Because I feel like it's a very easy thing because most of us probably have some kind of internal voice that's like, you're too fat. Mm -hmm. And so most people would identify with that. Whereas like now where the genre has evolved into is sort of like we can celebrate that and be okay. And so I think there still is some of that fantasy in my head of like, no, yes, it's all happy. Like it's all, it's all good. Like we're all okay. (laughs) But the reason that the ending was so stark to me was because the book does what you do. The entire book questions the premise of her internal beliefs about herself, mainly through him where she'd go, oh no, I can't eat that. And he would go, what do you mean you can't eat that? That's crazy. Right. Eat a piece of bread. And she'd right. be like, absolutely not. And he keeps questioning the premise. <laughs> yep, he does. That And th- that that was probably the part of the book that I, that was the most revelatory to me. Because I think, and again, like I read it in my early thirties, I think I would have been, or sorry, early twenties, I would have been in mm-hmm. that, man, I just let everybody know how old I am, I guess, in my... <laughs> Um, but, (laughs) um, when I was that age, like I had struggled a lot with the acceptance of being able to be overweight and be attractive. Cause I think there was so much less of that in the media, um, back then than there is today where it was like very body positivity. Now we're very comfortable. You're seeing a lot more like questioning the premise again of like, this is the only beauty standard that exists. Right. And when that, when I first read that book, it was the first time that I had seen outside of my own life that I had seen in fiction, a man being attracted to a plus size woman and encouraging her to be who she was and not trying to make her into something else. So that was fairly revelatory to me. And I think it was the first time I really understood that when I projected myself into other books where the heroines were like a size four, a size two, that I was projecting myself into their body and not into my body. So like I wasn't existing as a non-size two woman in romance until I read Bet Me. And I get a little emotional about it because like it was crazy to think that I had always fantasized myself out of my own body at all times. And this book was the first time that I ever read any fiction where I didn't fantasize myself out of my body. And I actually felt like her in that book. It was life change. It was seismic for me. And then I read Jennifer Weiner after that, who does a similar thing, right? Um, And then others after that. But I don't think I really realized how much internalized hatred I had of my own physical self. And it actually created sort of a romantic and emotional awakening in my own life of like feeling like, hey, maybe this is actually possible in real life in a way that I didn't think it was. And I came into my own comfort and comfortability because I read that book. And granted, I read it you know, 25 times. Like it wasn't just this one time. And then I was never, (laughs) it was like, I identified so much with her and everything that she felt and said was like literally word for word had happened in my own life. And I had happened to be dating someone who was similar to Cal in terms of like the way that he treated me as a person, Mm -hmm. not long after I read that book for the first time. And I don't think I would have allowed myself to believe that it was possible for that to happen if I hadn't read that book, because I wouldn't ever have questioned the premise in my own head of what I believed about my own self inside my own body in a romantic relationship. So like in terms of the level of effect that that book has had on me in my lifetime, very few things have had that kind of impact on me before. Wow. 
Yeah. Because can you think? I'm trying to think through like movies and TV shows I've seen with a plus size woman where it was not treated. Her, her looks were not treated as a joke. Right. Or a punchline. Or a punchline. Certainly not when I was young. I think they no. exist now. Yes. Or they're yes. starting to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting because I think so much of it, like so much of what has happened, and I do think Jenny Cruzy and Jennifer Weiner and people like that were part of this deconstruction happening. But I think what's happened is that the men in the world don't actually think that way. Hmm. The men in the world are not ashamed of women's bodies in terms of like, I'm not making a generalization about all men. What I'm Mm -hmm. saying is there are plenty of men in the world who actually like women who have larger bodies, like not just that they're not a size two, because of course, like if you are over a size 12 and you, and you would be considered to be plus size when sometimes when we say like on TV, like they're not they're a plus size girl. What we mean is more like a size eight to 12. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like if you are physically inhabiting a body that is over size 12, there are not, there's not a dearth of men who are attracted to that size. And again, I'm cishet. So I'm speaking of men, women, because that's my mentality. But what's amazing is that as I aged and I aged out of that phase where I was fantasizing myself out of my own body, I was like asking men about it. Right. So like when I would date people and I'd be like, what was your thought process about like being attracted to someone who's not small? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, this is, why are you asking me this question? This you're normal. You know what I mean? Like that was always the, you're beautiful. You're attractive you're hot, like all of those things. And Mm -hmm. I never saw myself that way. And what I realized, and this was like an essential pain. I cannot even describe how painful it was is if you think about plus size women in fiction, the reason we didn't see them is not because men don't like plus size women. It's because women don't like plus size women because that's the market that they're playing to. The market they're playing to is who buys romance novels? Why can't we see plus size women on the cover of romance novels? It's not because men don't want to see plus size women. It's because we're all fantasizing ourselves out of our bodies. Oh my God. Right. Wait, we're the problem. Well, not (laughs) (laughs) damn it, Becca. (laughs) I know not we're the problem. Like we're so horrible. We should feel ashamed of ourselves, but it's like everything that when you first realize that you have believed something that is not correct about yourself or is not correct about the world, the first response is always like, wait a minute, that can't possibly be true. But then it's like, but wait, what else do we expect? Like, what could we, what else, how else could we possibly have grown up? Like I grew up in an athletic family with very thin, generally speaking, women in my family who were all extremely athletic and I was not. So already I didn't fit in in that physical space. And then additionally, I grew up being projected to me a model of health that was not within my grasp to reach. So of course, I'm going to feel like I need to change myself in order to fit that standard. Of course, I'm not going to be comfortable in my own body because I'm constantly being sub consciously told that I am the problem, like that my body is the problem or my health is the problem. So of course I'm going to believe that even when people well-meaningly talk about that, it's almost like, what else do I expect myself to believe? And then I look back at my 27 year old self and I think, gosh, poor Becca. I had this experience where I had a guy who asked me out like 10 times and he would just, and he kept just persistently asking me out. And I'd be like, you can't possibly be attracted to me because you're so attractive. And so I'm just going to be like, you're joking with me or there's someone filming us on candid camera or something like that. And I never took him seriously. And then a year later, a friend of mine was talking to me about him and he was like, are you kidding me? Like he was, he was in love with you. Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, no, 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 not possible. Right. But it wasn't because 
he wasn't, it was because I couldn't imagine that he was. So if I couldn't imagine him being that way, and so my imagination had to change before my physical, actual response to people could change. Because in the moment, I couldn't imagine it would be any different. And people like Jenny Cruzy and Jennifer Weiner and like anyone who writes curvy girl romance at this point, to me is like, you are helping us to imagine a world in which plus size bodies are not only attractive to men, but they're attractive to women because we now can fantasize ourselves into a plus size body that we love and cherish and that we think is sexy and that we're confident in. And that will be the ultimate shift over the long term, right? Is when we can fantasize when, when women, and again, I'm speaking of like myself, when I, as a woman, can fantasize myself into a plus size body that is sexy and confident and loved and wanted, like all of that is what will change. And that can't happen without us first recognizing that we had that feeling about ourselves so many years ago, right? Or we grew up with that feeling or whatever. I can't help that, but I can help how I feel about myself today. When we get frustrated about our, how we feel about our bodies, like when, when a woman or a man or anyone, any gender says to me, like, I don't like my body. I always feel so sad for the person inside of that body because I'm like, your body got you here and did it's the best that it could do to get you to this place. And I want to have compassion on that person And also help you to feel like it's okay to love yourself, right? Like to feel that love for yourself. But we can't do that until you feel like it's okay to not like who you are. And then to see that there might actually be, and again, it's the imagination. Like I have to be able to imagine myself as something that's loved, which is why representation is so important and why seeing, and, and again, it's not important only to the people who are being represented. It's important to the people who are not. When I see fat women being loved and appreciated on television or in romance novels, it's easier for me, yes, to believe that I could be loved, but it's also easier for other people to empathize with a person who is something that they don't like or understand and who is also worthwhile and good and like worth time and worth someone loving. And if we don't see that, if I don't see that about people who aren't like me, then I am losing humanity in myself. Like it's representation is everything in every way. It's everything. Yeah. I have told this story several times. That was exactly how I felt when I took my kids to see Black Panther, my Mm -hmm. four white kids. And at first, I mean, it's, it's, one of my all-time favorite movies, but at first I was enthralled watching the children of color in the audience and thinking, oh my God, what it must be like to see a superhero who looks like you. That is so cool. And then I started looking at my kids thinking, it is also important that they see superheroes who do not look like them, that Mm -hmm. they do, that they do not grow up thinking that they are the standard superhero. Right. That anybody right. else could be a superhero and it right. blew me away to think that it is important particularly if you're part of any dominant culture it's very mm-hmm. important to see someone who is not like you in the yeah. starring role right because it is about imagination so it's like i said it's it's not possible to explain how seismic this book was for me and it was for that reason exactly it taught me so much about my own self. Wow. This is amazing. So (laughs) where, no, truly amazing. Okay. So tell me, what are you reading right now? So I just actually finished Apples Will Fall Mm -hmm. um, of Leon Moriarty's. And I decided to go back and start from book number one of hers, like the very, very earliest book. And um, I'm going to go, I've read, I think five or six of her others, other books and had recently read um, the things Alice forgot. Have you read Uh, that? What Alice forgot? What Alice forgot. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's a good one. 
literally like if we wanted to take a segue into how our memories define us and how we allow our memories to define us, that book, if you liked the discussion that we just had as two very conceptual people about Jenny Cruzy, you have to read what Alice forgot. It will change your life about how you think about it. And because my sister is a gerontologist and she works with like Alzheimer's care, that is actually true. Like what Ooh. you believe about yourself and what you remember changes your identity. So like almost to a point where if you hold so tightly onto memories that you have that are bad, that it's making you represent, that's why we call it representation, right? It's making you represent that reality to yourself over and over and over again. It's why imagination is so key. If you can imagine something, it will change you. So if you change the way you think about something, it can change what you believe about it. Okay. Well, Becca, on a personal note, I just have to say that this podcast exists specifically because of you, because of a consultation we did where I was doing my Julie thing of maybe, 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 maybe. And you, here, oh, here we go again, Julie. Should have had the tissues with me. You made me focus and you asked me questions. And by the end of it, I was like, I know what I want to do. And this podcast would not exist without your guidance and Frankly, most of my writing career would not exist without your your guidance and your help to focus. And I just love you. And I'm thrilled for the opportunity Aww. to talk to you. And I'm so glad you visited me. I mean, this was the best podcast that I've done. And I'm not surprised. <laughs> and I think I told you. So you, if you don't know what the strengths are, I apologize for this, but I can't not say it. And I think there's this, there's a strength called intellection which is extremely, extremely beneficial when you want to think deeply about stuff, right? And be really complex. And, and when you told me the concept of what you were going to do with the podcast is in terms of like, you were going to read their favorite book and then like sort of deconstruct things with them. I'm like, oh my God, you're going to rock that because intellection is so good at that. Like read something, think super deeply about it, pull out all the conceptual stuff, but be really interested in what their opinions are and things. And I'm not surprised at all that this is the best podcast that I've done just because I sort of expected that it would be. So thank you for, I mean, I, some of the stuff that I talked about on here, it's like, if you're listening to this because you coached with me, this is more vulnerable than I've ever been with anybody ever right. That I've coached with. And I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just, it's very interesting how much, how much fiction impacts us deeply. And when mm -hmm. we talk about our favorite books, it's so often because something about that book has stayed with us for forever. And like, when I say that bet me was seismic in my life, I mean, I don't know if I ever would have been able to have a healthy dating relationship in my adult life if I hadn't read that book, but I hadn't seen that represented before, right? Like the way that I feel represented and mm -hmm. fiction can do that in a way that nothing else can. And if you are writing representation in fiction that's being read by other humans, you are literally changing the world because you're changing people's minds one at a time. You're helping them to imagine a world that's different from the world that they currently live in. And there is nothing else that ever will change anything about the world except by the difference of our imagination, like what we can imagine to be true and what we can't. So for those of us who feel like we need to do something that matters, if you are a writer, you are literally changing the world one person at a time, period. Why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you and all of your wonderful work? I always encourage people to come to the Quit Cast, like to the Q-U-I-T, C-A-S-T, Quit Cast on YouTube. And that's where... Um, if you want to look at like, what do I do? That's, that's what I do. That's the place. My mystery books are available. Penance on the Prairies is the first one, the, the very first one of those, but I always recommend people go look at the YouTube channel because it's free. 
And then you can just see like, who is this person and what does she think? And you'll find out. (laughs) All right. Well, this has been a delight. I hope you will come back anytime you have a book you want to tell me about because it is always so much fun talking to you. I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to hear what you think of this book. And if you have other recommendations of curvy girl romances that you've liked in the past. Links to all the books we discussed are in the show notes or at my website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. You can also find me on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. If you have a book you want to tell me about, click on the Be a Guest button on my website or Instagram bio so we can chat. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with someone you love and rate it on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to hit the follow or subscribe button. Remember, in addition to hosting this podcast, I'm also the author of several contemporary romances. And because I contain multitudes, I'm also the co-author of a paranormal werewolf romance, all of which are available wherever you buy your favorite books. Even better, you can request all of them at your local library. And in case you're wondering, authors do get paid when libraries buy their books, and then you get to read them for free, so it is a win-win situation for all of us. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you at the library. Damn it, Becca!